On January 19th, Indiana Froskerin Black announced her departure from the European broadcast team. Up until this point, she has been in countless controversies as she had slowly become infatuated with extreme modern feminism and victimizing herself from criticism, and even having a huge meltdown on GeForce Network talking about sexism and gaming. But to explore how this all happened, we have to start with the beginning. Playing video games alone is extremely boring, especially League of Legends, Valorant, CSGO, you name it. But this is where Topin GG comes in. Topin is the first teammate finding website that will match you with hand verified League of Legends pro players in less than 30 seconds. The best part? You can use it whenever you want as they are literally available around the clock. With over thousands of happy customers, they also offer a no questions asked money back guarantee. And you get a 50% discount on your first order by using my code HASMAT, so why not give it a try? Check out Topin.gg. Froskerin's earliest venture into League of Legends can be traced back to an interview with Esports Heaven where she said that she grew up relatively poor for the early part of her childhood. Her mother, who was a single parent in a divorced household, did well with the resource she was given. Video games for Froskerin though effectively acted as a babysitter for a good chunk of her childhood. As her mother was juggling between a full-time job and night classes, she couldn't be there all the time and that's where Froskerin occupied herself with the game Link. She and her mother would eventually get every console with Sonic the Hedgehog for the computer and then later got a Sega, a Dreamcast, and of course a Nintendo. Her mother was an active participant in her video game education, reading up on games and trying her hand at Pokemon occasionally. It wasn't until college though that she got into League of Legends. One of her roommates had a beta key and introduced her to the game. Froskuren didn't feel the love of a champion until Nidalee was released. Since video games were already a huge part of Froskuren's life, she naturally wanted to become a professional player at first, playing around 14 to 16 hours a day religiously. I'd spend hours doing exercises where I achieved a fairly high solo queue ranked at the time, Diamond 1, but that was nothing in the upper end of the ELO spectrum, and in the end, I simply was never going to be good enough to play professionally. I did play semi-professionally for an organization called Fornot. what a disaster, they would later become Quantic Gaming and house names like Kramer, Bloodwater, and One Bad Brad, I believe. I played on their all-female team before Team Siren was a thing, I actually jungled for them and this was during the high of Moscow 5, so Shivana was extremely popular. This would eventually fall apart and Froskirin went into streaming where she commentated games as she spectated viewers and commented over their games, which basically amounted to coaching kind of. She eventually joined the Robert Morris University Illinois team as a League of Legends coach and later delved into the analyst role in Roar. This was a team where she and Mirki began talent scouting for a team that would attempt to qualify for the 2015 North American Summer LCS split after training in China. However, as they entered the qualifier, they would be knocked out by Cloud9. The team then later disbanded and Froskerin went to Team Dig. Dignitas EU. Froskurin thought that she could translate her commentary from stream into casting and had approached the North American branch of the ESL and got the job doing Go for LOLs and Electronic Pro series. In a blog post, she wrote that she started casting the LPL after Kelsey Moser wanted an English stream of the Chinese Pro League, LPL. They would restream the LPL onto a platform easily accessible in the US by muting the mainstream and cast the games in English. We took a stream from 8 people to 44,000 for the finals. On the grace of Twitch, co caster Pira Technics, Kelsey and I were flown out to Twitch Studio in California to use their setup to cast the finals. We made the graphics, ran the OBS and secured a deal to have a spectator spot in the client. It was an incredible achievement on the back of three people and I extend all my gratitude to Gravy at Twitch, Kelsey for being our producer and Pira for carrying me through it. Eventually the LPL English project would close and Riot would open an official stream through the Oceanic office. Pyra left for the EULCS, Kelsey Moser for the Score Esports and I would sit out for the first split. This is incident also where controversy would arise. Froskurin seemed to be forgotten about while all the other members of the LPL fanstream got a job offer. She then would jump around in the scene casting games where she could, such as in the Alpha Draft Challenger League and the League of Legends Japan League. But then one person would change Froskurin's career around, Richard Lewis. Richard had written investigative exposes with surprising accuracies in the esports scene for over 10 years and the next one was going to be no different. On an episode of Trash Talk, he said, The thought process of Riot is that they don't like female casters or uh, uh, analyzers because they believe they don't think a female can talk authoritatively about the game to their audience and be listened to. It's not the world we're going to live in because the new broadcast speed setup, and for whatever reasons, Froskorin isn't a part of it. Now, the simple way to put it is 
it's quite obvious to me in terms of speculating from behind the scenes and seeing the way these things have played out and the way one of the key things about being in the industry in esports is you learn how to translate what a PR statement says into what is really going on there. And then when you know some things behind the scenes, you can then extrapolate that and understand that when they say one thing, it actually means this. When the real reason as to why Frostgone isn't in this position is people don't like, people in the public don't like her, her attitude or they perceive her a certain way. People within the industry, people within Riot and within the people who make these decisions, it would seem to me, don't particularly like the kind of bent she takes or they'd rather she did something in a more up be an only, only, see, people are use words like positive here. Positive is not the case. Artificial hype, that's what they want in this. The only one who was a part of a Riot broadcast team at all was Shox, who was a former journalist turned host for the European broadcast. She did not comment on games or do much analysis at that time. Richard Lewis also said that Riot didn't like how Froskarian conducted herself on social media or her edgy personality. Frosk, however, worked hard in silence, not commenting on the issue because she still wanted a job at Riot, but her dreams would shortly become reality as Froskarian became the first female caster hired by Riot Games. Froskarian was loved by many in the early stages of her esports career. She seemed to be proficient and knowledgeable on the Chinese teams and the Chinese esports region, but her career wasn't free from drama. For instance, in 2014 there was a drama that occurred due to Froskarian mischaracterizing the pro player Yellowstar. Thorin explains in his article on Dot .esports titled Froskarian, throwing the expert out with the inaccuracy, where he rightly defended Froskarian. He essentially said that one shouldn't disregard an expert entirely due to one faulty mistake that they have made, citing that Froskarian Karen is an expert on the Chinese pro scene still, but just because she made a mistake regarding Yellowstar's champion pool, she shouldn't be perceived to be a non-credible person, because her expertise on China is still incredibly valuable. He also mentioned how much of an interesting guest she was. Froskaren is my favorite kind of summon and insight guest, since she would attempt an answer to any question I had without undue hesitation or a tendency to err on the side of the political answer. She got some facts wrong, no doubt some of her opinions were entirely counter to what I and others may think on some topics. But her perspective was uniquely her own, interesting and often obvious and exciting inherent value. Thorin later thought that she had the necessary skills to be a good commentator. The actual thing I took away from the game that was most significant was, who is this female commentator who's doing these games? Like, bearing in mind I knew that it was kind of like a low, low tech, I thought to myself, like, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna have much expectations here. I've seen what it's like when just fans do things and they, people who, people who maybe have some knowledge but they probably won't have many good delivery skills or they don't know how to structure what they're doing. And what I found was, the person doing this color commentary everything about it was impressive. What Torin mentioned is also of significance, as in her early career, Froskirin was adamant about responding directly to criticism and threads about her, especially on her Reddit account named That European Fangirl. The Leona Yellowstar drama would also have an effect on a later drama regarding Froskirin. Due to that drama and as well as the background with her being an LPL caster, she stupidly decided to go the other direction intentionally as an analyst rather than her usual story-driven narration. And when she was working with IE M. Kolong, she massively overcriticized QG Reapers, the Chinese team, when they faced Fnatic, which is the team Yellowstar was from during the Yellowstar drama. She would later respond to the criticism in a tweet longer stating, I appreciate the passion of the community to make such an overwhelming response. I always value criticism as a tool to continue for growth and improvement. I feel that I have an incredibly good grasp of my weakness as a caster, fluency being a primary target. Fluency is defined as the ability to concisely and distinctly convey information. I apologize if I appear too harsh on QG Reapers yesterday. Naturally, as a LPL caster, I have more to say concerning the Reapers' performance and expectations because I know the team more intimately. The Fnatic vs QG cast was much more narrative driven and prepped as I felt the storylines versus the execution were far more important a topic with such a western dynasty. It was a different style from the Dignitas vs QG match that was consciously chosen and that's reflected when you compare the sets side by side. I will learn from this great experience at IEM Cologne and continue to refine my technique to offer the fans and players the best experience I can give. When she came in front of a larger audience at Worlds 2016, she was noticeably bad and had some major gaffes in her first showing. She did improve over her career, but a lot of people wrote her off after that initial impression. In 2016, she criticized Monte Cristo and Doa by suggesting that they got away with being more jokey than other commentators, a privilege of some kind, while disregarding or omitting the fact that these two casters were the casting duo and had years of experience and built up rapport with the fans. The original Reddit post that mentioned this stated
stated that Froskeren's main point seems to be that if their banter had come from another casting duo, then it would have been seen as cringy or even unprofessional. She also stated that it's more that any caster that are not Monte or Doa are criticized as unprofessional or cringy when not talking about the game 24-7. Monte Cristo responded saying, you're talented, you're skilled, you're also young and voicing entitled opinions instead of looking at reasoning. And when you say shit like this, it undermines the decade of work I have done to work on my skills. Doa and I spent years together working on a synergy. Your tweets tonight reduce that to favoritism. Bottom line, you're good, you're young, please don't detract from my work to justify fan reactions. However, in 2018, Froskirin announced that she will be joining the EULCS broadcast starting in spring 2019. The decision to make the switch to EU came due to a variety of reasons according to her, such as access to a fully staffed English content team, analyst desk with monitors, and the ability to cast in a stadium to a live audience. Essentially, she saw the EULCS as a new place to develop herself. In this AMEA Reddit thread though, she would get hate from the league community saying that they will stop watching the EULCS. I don't really think Reddit wants this AMA to be honest. Why do you call us sexist? What is your response to the people claiming your race is sexist against white males? Good luck mods. People weren't happy with her recent behavior, but uh, rightly so. You see, most of the hate aimed at her is due to her victim complex or the way she reacts to criticism. When people point out issues about her, she often claims that it's because she is a woman or a part of the LGBTQ community. When the PAX debacle came out, she was firmly on the side of Daniel Z. Klein, and when people like Kelsey Moser commented that she felt that the exclusion of men from a panel was a step in the wrong direction, Froskirin attacked her and claimed that her herself was a feminist, implying that Kelsey wasn't because she didn't agree with her. When she was criticized for her semi-finals casting, instead of doing what fellow caster Dracos did and acknowledged the issue, she abruptly stated that she was going to quit casting. Sad to read this thread, changed my casting style to be entirely map focused Dracos and I have built a synergy all year, it just feels like it doesn't matter what I do, I give up Reddit, you win, I'll retire after this worlds, cheers. However, Froskirin would eventually also fall into extremist feminism and be a part of the ongoing culture war by adhering to woke culture. She, for example, talked about diversity, stating, as always, very excited for the LSE to begin. That being said, we really need to talk diversity in esports broadcast because holy shit, that is a lot of white people, just blindingly white, as far as the eye can see, white. Discussions like this in European communities doesn't bode well as Europeans don't engage in such a culture war, well, at least not at the time, a Russian person would be very different to a Spaniard. And there aren't many people of color in Europe in comparison to America. People naturally laughed at her as the cast was already diverse, such as Quickshot being from South Africa, Shox Belgium, and Bully from France. Who would have thought a region of mostly white people would have a broadcast team of mostly white people? This is legit projecting American issues into Europe, it's a really low blow. Nobody complains that LCK and LPL staff is 100% Asian, so let's just keep forced diversity out of the discussion in EU, which is 95% white. Froskirin had extreme belief in her convictions. She would continue to argue with the Twitter community about the topic of diversity. She later boasted about how she has a diversity and development dignity in the league scene and how good it feels to block racists. On a podcast hosted by Evil Geniuses, she went on another crazy rant about sexism in the esports industry. It shouldn't have to be that you must be excellent to get in the positions that we have. When I look around and I see a lot of mediocre, I see so many mediocre just pale males as far as the eye can see. And it just, it it kills me that I'm considered the affirmative action when these motherfuckers are given so many passes that I would not get access to. Um, and like, uh, I know, I, I grow my hair out now long. Uh, if you guys don't know, when I first started broadcasting, I had like a fully shaved head. I had like a mohawk at one point. I was very gender non-conforming. I was like very deep into like the masculine butch. I would never say butch, like butch lesbians would be like, she's androgynous, it's fine. But like for straight people, real butch, <laughs> um, <laughs> the scale shrinks for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, they just couldn't handle it. And I was like, I'm actually gonna have to grow my hair out and be more femme and traditionally uh, feminine presenting if I'm going to get farther in this career. And people kept telling me like, nah, that's not it. You're actually just getting better. I'm like, am I actually getting better? Or is my hair just longer and I'm somehow more palatable? I somehow speak softer. I'm not as aggressive. Like, I'm not 
Froskurin also had this weird pin tweet for years about how your straight girlfriend would think she was sexually attractive. In another instance, Frost got into an argument with Atlas, another former LPL caster. This is where Atlas made a joke. Okay, how about this one? The LPL needed half their team to be Korean to win worlds for the first time. Frost replied by saying, Rookie did speak Mandarin when he lifted the cup under the LPL banner. Doing B never played in the LCK. Scout was a substitute and built his entire career in LPL. It's a joke, Frost. What's the punch? Line, because I think it hinges on putting the LPL successes down to the LCK, and I think that's factually wrong. As a former LPL commentator and your friend, I am kinda speechless honestly. In 2020, Froskurin made some kind of a deal with G2 to wear their World's 2020 jersey, which some would consider a conflict of interest for a commentator who cast their games. Fast forward in 2022, she made an interesting Andrea Tate comment about a G2 World's jersey, probably after the incident G2 CEO Carlos had with Andrea Tate. She would eventually also get into some obscure drama with Quickshot. Frosk initially stated this on stream. Trevor knows what he did, and if he wants to communicate with me to try to solve things, I've reached out to him many times, and he can. But he's adverse to conflict and afraid of me, so he won't do it. <laughs> Quickshot then later took to Twitter and said this is completely inaccurate, untrue and not reflect at all of her personal and professional challenges. Froskuren's experience with criticism perceived as hatred caused her to go downhill, but to be fair she had a minority of people who would be outright sexist against her, but this vocal yet minor group of people did not represent everyone. However, her victim complex and disregard of constructive criticism made it easy to dislike her, and her distorted image of everything and everyone being sexist and races caused her to leave the League of Legends scene. I have decided to not re-sign with the LSE for the 2021 season. I cannot reveal the next steps yet, but I've always felt strongly about moving into management and development positions. I wish the LEC broadcast teams and fans the very best. I absolutely loved it there. She also made another tweet referencing a Reddit thread by saying, Ah, one last Reddit hate thread. Nice. I gave you so much in my life and effort and it was never worth it to you to try for your acceptance. You don't know anything. You torture players and personalities. You truly are, and I mean this the worst aspect of this incredible community. The community's reaction to this was 50-50, either happiness that she left or sadness of her departure. Prior to Twitch, YouTube and any other similar platforms, there was G4. Comcast owned the channel and launched the channel in 2002. Their original goals with the channel was to have an outlet where video game companies could pay to have their products featured in original programming where they would target young adult audiences. The leader of G4, Charles Hairchorn, expected video games creators themselves to eventually produce a programming for the G4 channel, basically following the footsteps of MTV, which provided music video producers with a venue for non-traditional television programming. As such, G4 was going to become a venue for non-traditional television programming. G4 was doing well kinda in the early days, but once YouTube, Twitch and other platforms entered the picture, things became different. Interest in maintaining G4 was eventually stopped after a decade of running. However, fast forward a few years into 2021, G4 was relaunched. The idea was again the same, bringing back a corporate outlet where other video game companies could advertise their product on G4 as if it was a part of the program. The program would air on YouTube and Twitch and initially was hosted by Kevin Pereira and Adam Sessler with some newcomers. One month after announcing her departure from LSC in February of 2021, Froskuren was announced to join the show G4 to help discuss esports. In the course of her short-lived G4 career, Froskuren engaged actively with the culture war promoting wokeism and modern feminism. G4 survival was doomed already from the start, as independent content creators already did commentary better than a corporate outlet, so the very notion of having this back in the scene was illogical. What's more interesting is that Froskuren is commonly attributed to have single-handedly killed the G4 revival. In a Midnight's Edge video titled, Frosk spills the beans in a tell-all interview, blames everyone else for G4 failure, he speculated reasonably that the G4 revival was due to a corporate executive, which was the son of a corporate head show and asked his dad whether they could revive G4 because the girlfriend of that executive, Olivia Munn, wanted to go back on the show that she had previously when it was alive. Anyways, Frosk was already under scrutiny by the audience of G4, mainly because she wasn't sufficiently informed about the number of topics discussed on the show, but regardless, she had strong opinions on topics she had no clue about. There were also the meltdown Frosk had on the show on January 11th, where she out of the blue transitioned to an extremely, extremely important important topic, sexism and gaming. But I actually want to talk about something so much more important than Red Dead Online, sexism in gaming. In joining G4, yes! 
in, this is not where I thought we were going, I know, but I'm here. I have no here. idea. I'm listening. Yeah. In joining G4, I was ecstatic to be part of something that I grew up watching as a child. But every time G4 is brought up in various channels, even in this YouTube channel, we have the chat in front of us, I can see you, without a doubt, there will be backlash because I'm not as bangable as the previous host. It's somehow- Talk to him, Frost! It has somehow been expected that you can talk about how much you jerked off to women as a compliment. That's it's weird. not a compliment. It's weird. It's dehumanizing and it's weird. Women do not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Morgan Webb, Olivia Munn did not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Hey, she cooking, y'all. And that's just <laughs> obvious sexism. You don't need to explicitly objectify women or declare that you hate women to be sexist. Just go ahead and check out Thorne's latest meltdown on Twitter for some spark notes. Now, here at X-Play, our reviews are written and produced by a team of people. There are too many games for one person to shoulder the burden. So we divide and conquer. And when we use language like we or I, that's the reviewer. That's coming from the mouth and experience of the reviewer reading that review. And that's not to say that Gerard, TBH, Adam, or myself don't contribute to the reviews. We absolutely do. But it'll always be in varying degrees and take a whole team behind us. That's why we're X-Play and not Adam-Play. We have done the experiment and controlled for the variables. Adam will read a script written by the same writer that I will read the other half of the script for, but I'll be the one flamed. And yeah, it also happens to Gerard and TBH, but that doesn't discount the sexism of how it happens to me when it does. Both things can be true, that there is a general hatred of any change that isn't Adam, and that all receive special flame just for being a woman. And I wish I could turn the camera around so that you could see the incredible team that make X-Play. Half of our producers and writers are women. Emily, Abby, Megan, Joe, Jake, Zipper, Gabby, it goes on and on and on. Former writers that are now on ATOS like Vanessa. When you're in our DMs or on those YouTube comments or in Twitch chat right now, those reactionary threads thinking that I'm somehow ruining your current X-Play experience because you can't objectify me how you previously did to Morgan or that I'm somehow less qualified to speak on something but you can't quite put your finger on why even though I'm reading the exact same script as Adam but you have no problem with he's part of it. You're letting your unconscious biases ruin my day and you're gatekeeping the gaming space. So maybe for 2022, we'd be a bit nicer, a bit more self-reflective, and we enjoy the fact that people are working hard to make free content for you. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Peace! This meltdown was actually reinforced by Blair Herter as senior vice president when he stated on Twitter, Grateful to spend my life with a woman who has smashed glass ceilings. Honored to work with the woman of G4's past and humans like Frost Gurren today. Proud to work at a place that makes stuff like this. If you don't hear the below, unfollow me and don't watch us. We're not for you. Lo and behold, the aftermath of this scandal caused a few thousand of people to unsubscribe and the views of the YouTube videos from G4 would plummet. And this iconic phrase, If you don't like it, don't watch it. Would echo into the culture war sphere such as film critics using it as a humorous clip when big companies like Disney wasting millions on dead on arrival shows like Echo. Now, as previously said, YouTuber gamers alike already outcompete G4 doing what G4 does without a paycheck by their parent company Comcast. Interestingly enough, a total 180 was whipped out by G4 when on March 11th they did a livestream special with the Austin show and Amaranth was featured and her um attractive appeal. One week later, the same senior VP who supported Frascurian's meltdown announced that he was leaving G4 and moving to the Netherlands. G4 later rebranded to X-Play as the original name had become toxic and they disassociated themselves with the controversies by doing so. On October 16th, 2022, it was announced that G4 would be ceasing operations. There were several factors that caused G4's discontinuation, such as low viewership, a lack of audience strategy, the leadership being absent and constantly changing, 
competition with streaming content creators on YouTube and Twitch, cord cutting, under promotion and high expenditures. Frascarin left G4 due to layoffs somewhere around September of 2022. What's also very interesting and not so known is that there was someone on 4chan who claimed that they used to know Frosk back in her freshman year of college. What he would come to claim comes to contradict what Frosk states in her many interviews, talking about her single mother and how much of her beginnings were humble. The 4chan states, I'm a dude, there was a moment in time where we were super tight, probably the tightest of all her friends. When I knew her, one of the things that we didn't see eye to eye on was that she seemed very vain and superficial. She was the type of person that cared way more about how something looked than what kind of feel it needed to evoke. That's why she's super bug about her presentation now that she has money. A good example of this, that is public knowledge, is her constant changes in names. Froskerin, Frosk, Indiana Black. When I knew her, she wanted to be called Rai. She hated her real name because she thought it was a boy's name. Her full given name is Devon Rian Moore. She legitimately comes from a world of privilege. Her dad was a Wall Street guy that made millions on short trading, cutting and gutting. She blamed him for being one of those guys that made bank of the kinds of practices that lead to the 2008 recession and not giving a damn about it. Every time that topic came up, she said that she hated what he stood for, but it became obvious after a while that she herself was a product of growing up in a mansion on a private lake in Tigard. Pretty sure she had some kind of a hedge fund but was upset because her dad was being a dick about giving her access. The fortune would go into more in depth about their college days and then later stated, A few years later I looked her up and I saw that she became an esports personality. My first thought was like, damn, interesting. I remember her saying being a game journalist was her dream job, which is why I guess she's doing G4 now and saw all the names that she went through and that was still on brand for her. I saw that she was all controversial and stuff because she gets after people that don't like her. That's pretty on brand with a lot of what I've said too. She can't handle not being liked to her own detriment. That's why keeping her sexuality as secret in college was so important to her. With this post, the fortuner attached a few pictures of Roscurring dating back to 2009. Whether you believe what he has to say is up to you. Her decade-long pattern seems to have halted with G4 and Froskerin announced that she's leaving the entire esports industry on Twitter. I've been angry for a long time with my peers for not using their power and voice to stand up for others in the industry. Had to come to some hard terms that people who had known for years who I thought were good friends just weren't. Devastated me for a long time. Anyway, I'm leaving the industry, found new work elsewhere. This industry is really messed up and what happened to me and plenty of others wasn't fair and it could have been avoided if we all stood up together. You let me down, but I get why. Cheers and good luck. Much like the LSE departure announcement, people were either happy or sad that she was gone. Quickshot coincidentally tweeted on the same day, shower thought of the day. If everywhere you go things are on fire, consider that you may be the match. Nowadays her social media is on a standstill and her Twitter account seems to be either deleted or deactivated.